Would you open your Bibles, first of all, tonight to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Chapter 1. If you were here this morning, well, let me ask this. How many of you were here this morning? Okay, now let me ask you, how many of you were not here this morning? Where were you? <laughs> now, it's none of my business, but I'm glad you're here tonight, praise God. Now, this morning, as Peter mentioned, uh, I was awakened at 430 the Lord gave me a specific message for my time here in this church. And, of course, it wasn't just for this church. It's for whoever might receive it. Because no, no word from God is a private interpretation, the Bible says. So, at the end of the service, uh, Peter and Christine asked me to pray about they're becoming a Heritage of Faith affiliated church with our ministry. And we did that. We prayed over them and, and declared that they are now, even though we've been friends for years, but officially affiliated with Heritage of Faith Ministerial Association, Heritage of Faith International. And we have churches all over the world, Bible schools all over the world. And... Uh, I am received as an apostle to many churches, not only around America, but in other nations as well. I don't go around promoting myself as an apostle. Uh, I just, I'm just Jerry Savelle. And I'm grateful for all that God has done for me and what he's doing for me. I'm grateful for the position he's placed me in in the body of Christ. But I'm um, don't go around bragging on it, bragging about it. Um, I'm just Jerry Savelle. What you see is what you get. Amen. And uh, but m many years ago, the Lord impressed upon me that He was moving in, moving me into a new ministry or a new office of ministry. Now, I have been privileged to function in all five offices. I started as a street evangelist. Didn't anybody know Jerry Savelle existed? And when I accepted the call, no church was inviting me to speak. No, no convention was asking me to come. The Lord said, don't wait for an invitation. You got a mission field, downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. This is 1969. The hippie movement was on. The drug culture was being introduced into our nation and across the world. And so I had a mission field. Uh, drug addicts, prostitutes, alcoholics, those were my first congregations. And uh, it, as I was obedient to the Lord, God began to work miracles in our streets. And eventually the police department asked me to come and preach in the jails. We had miracles in the jails. Eventually, the sheriff's department asked me to travel to all the prisons in the state of Louisiana. We had miracles in the prisons. And then finally, the churches decided, maybe that boy has something. <laughs> and they began to invite me to come. And, uh, and then Brother Copeland's second visit to our city, the first time he came in February of 1969, is when I... Uh, surrendered my life to the ministry. I heard the call in 1957 watching Oral Roberts on television. And uh, I didn't answer the call then. That's not what I wanted to do. I already had my life mapped out from the time I was nine years old. I was going to follow in the footsteps of my father. My dad raced automobiles. My dad restored classic automobiles. He was, as you would call here in your nation, a... a uh, uh, Metal beater, panel beater, and uh, we call them paint and body men back home. And that's what my dad did, and that's what I wanted to do. And he began teaching me the, the trade at nine years old. I heard the call of God just before I turned 11 years old. God was fouling up my plans. And so I didn't tell a soul about it, and I thought if I don't tell anybody, then I won't have to do it. And God will find somebody who really wants to do that. But in 1969, and of course, by this time, uh, I'm, uh, you know, married and, and have two children. 
and I own my own automotive business. Uh, my dad and I are building race cars and hauling them all over the southern part of the United States. I was restoring classic cars, doing paint and body work, living my dream. Loved every minute of it. I loved the challenge. I loved it when people say, that's a total wreck. And well, that's the, that's the one I wanted to tackle. We got a problem here. Just continue going and see if it'll correct itself. Or somebody back there in the sound booth will do it. When we get to heaven, there will be no sound booths. <laughs> no microphones. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not quite ready to go, but I'm looking forward to that. Praise God. And anyway, I'm, I'm living my dream. I'm doing exactly what I said I was going to do at nine years old. But I wasn't living God's dream for my life. And when Brother Copeland came in February of 69, uh, I surrendered my life to the Lord, shut my business down, and began preparing for full-time ministry. And once again, uh, nobody knew I existed. Nobody was asking me to come. So I began my ministry as a street evangelist. And then uh, how many of you have seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution? I was in that. I wasn't in the movie. I was there. <laughs> But Brother Copeland came a second time just a few months later, and uh, he had an accident in his car on the way over there, so I repaired his car while he was in town, and that's really how I met him. He, even though I was in the service uh, the first meeting, the last night he was there, but I didn't meet him. And uh, But the second time he came, he had an accident in his car, asked the pastor if he knew anybody in the church that could repair his car while he was there that week. So pastor knew that's what I had done as before uh, preparing for ministry. So I repaired Brother Copeland's car. And uh, before he left town, he said, I met a man out in California who works with uh, young people, pre predominantly drug addicts and prostitutes, and much like what you're doing here in this city. And he said, the Lord impressed upon me to send you to California, pay your way, and tell you to stay as long as you believe God wants you to stay, and I want you to get connected with this man. His name was Dave Malkin, and um, Dave was a, a very successful landscape architect, and yet he was also uh, part of Campus Crusades for Christ, and he was one of the greatest soul winners I ever met in my life. So I stayed in Dave's home with his family, and we went to Pismo Beach, 1969. And there was 140,000 hippies on the beach during 4th of July. And we had 113 of us, and all of them had been led to the Lord by Dave Malkin. And uh, I made the 113th person in that group. And we all went to Pismo Beach and began sharing and witnessing. We baptized thousands in the Pacific Ocean. I stayed there for 13 days. And when it was time for me to come back home, uh, all the way up to Los Angeles, people were talking about what had happened, people being baptized in the ocean, and they were calling it the Jesus Revolution. Well, I got to be part of that. When the movie came out a few months ago, my daughter, Jerry Ann, said, Daddy, uh, I want to take you to this movie because I've heard you talk about it. And she was, uh, she was one year old when I was out there. And uh, she said, I've heard you talk about it, and I, I thought you might enjoy seeing this movie because it's about what you were involved in back there in 1969. I wept all the way through the movie. It brought back such wonderful memories. And uh, so I began my ministry as a street evangelist. I came back from California and began to organize teams of young people and, and station them all over our city. And we won hundreds of young people to the Lord. And then eventually, uh, Brother Copeland decided he just couldn't live without me <laughs> and asked me to come to Fort Worth and go to work with him and travel with him and uh, be his associate minister. And this was back in, once again, 1970 by now. And Brother Copeland began his ministry in 1967, so his ministry was still in an infant stage. And when I joined it, uh, it was Brother Copeland, Gloria, 
one secretary, one bookkeeper, and Brother Copeland's father, we all called him Granddad, A.W. Copeland, and Jerry Savell. That was Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association. Now there are 500 employees over there at KCM, and I like to remind them that when you lose a good man, it takes 500 <laughs> to replace him. <laughs> now he hadn't lost me, but I, uh, eventually the Lord impressed upon me to launch out into my own ministry, and, and he said, and you will remain a team for the rest of your lives. And so my, this is my 54th year in ministry, and 53 of those years, Kenneth Cope and I have preached all over the world together. We're still a team after all these years. So then um, when I went to work with Brother Copeland, uh, after I had been there one year, he began asking me to do his morning services. Now, back in those days, we didn't go anywhere for one night or two nights. Everywhere we went, we went for three weeks at a time. Brother Copeland used to say, it takes one week to break through all the unbelief and religious tradition. The second week, they started listening to what you say. And the third week, we have a move of God. And so that was our routine. Everywhere we went, three weeks, three services a day. And so he began having me teach the morning services. That's when the office of teacher was added to my ministry. But I was still an evangelist at heart. In fact, in between uh, sessions, <clears throat> In Brother Copeland's meetings, I would I would ask people to stay over after he got through teaching and give me 30 minutes to train you to become a soul winner. And then if you stayed in my session, you had to go out in the street and do what you just learned in that meeting. And so we would go out in the streets in every city that we went to, and we would witness, and we'd bring them back to the meetings. Brother Copeland, get them filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, now I'm not only an evangelist, but I am a teacher. And then in 1974, as I'm traveling around the country in my own ministry, um, there, was not, there was not a word of faith church in, in Fort Worth, Texas at that time. And the Lord said to me, uh, and I would go out and do meetings every week, and I'd leave on Thursday and end them on Saturday night and then come home. And he said, when you get home from this meeting, I want you to announce that you will begin doing services at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom on Sunday afternoon and take the word of faith to the people that have never heard it before. And so in obedience to the Lord, I began, I'd fly home on Saturday night after my meeting and on Sunday afternoon, I'd uh, have a service in the uh, Hilton Hotel Ballroom. And eventually it grew and grew and grew, and then people are saying, well, we, we want something for our children. Uh, when are we going to start having Sunday night services? I wound up with a church I never intended to start. <laughs> so now I'm a pastor. Okay, I'm pastoring uh, about 300 people. I mean, there was about 300 people showed up there in the early beginning stages of it. So now, I'm still an evangelist at heart, because everywhere I went, I won souls. In fact, that's what our Church Like Christian Biker Ministry is about. I started it 25 years ago so that I could continue to uh, win souls one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, through our Church Alight, Christian Bikers, and there are chapters all over the world, and uh, through the Church Alight, we have documented just that one outreach 560,000 people have come to Christ in 25 years. Praise God. So that's, that's uh, like the Apostle Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. I, I, I still love teaching. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I pastored for a number of years until the Lord began to launch me out into international ministry. And that meant I couldn't be home every Sunday and pastor a group of people. So I eventually uh, took my congregation and merged it with my pastor, my pastor that I was uh, with when I first moved to Fort Worth. His name was Harold Nichols. And so I took my congregation over to Harold Nichols. I submitted to him as my pastor, invited my congregation to do likewise so that I could now 
launch out into world evangelism. That requires the apostolic anointing because I'm not, I don't just go and teach. I go and plant, and that's what an apostle does. We plant churches. We plant Bible schools. We plant uh, orphanages. We plant uh, medical facilities. Job is our international director. He and Eric uh, that was here before travel all over the world overseeing all of the works that we've done and are endeavoring to establish all over the world. So, teacher, I mean evangelist, teacher, pastor, apostle. Then, in 1991, as I mentioned this morning, God through my spiritual fathers, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, announced that I had entered into a prophetic ministry. So, <laughs> as if I didn't have something to do. I, I found out when, when you're available to God, he just keeps adding to it, you know. So, uh, and tonight, uh, based on what Peter and Christine said this morning, that I am now an apostle to this church. Now, we've been involved in this church for many, many years, been involved in their lives, in their children's lives for many, many years. But he publicly declared me an apostle to this church. So therefore, I'm bringing to you, as I do in every church that receives me as an apostle, an apostolic message. And that's what I have for you tonight. So open to Romans chapter 1. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 1. And um, I want us to begin reading, first of all, in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Notice Paul says he was called to be an apostle. Notice he didn't say, I'm a self-appointed apostle. We got too many of them. We got too many self-appointed prophets. If you're not appointed and separated by God as an apostle or a prophet or any other office of ministry, then go on, don't go around calling yourself one. Okay. We got that established. Amen. Amen. And so notice Paul said, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Then in verse 8 he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And then he makes mention of the fact that he longed to come to them on several occasions, but he was prevented from coming. He uses the phrase in verse 13, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto. Other translations say, I was prevented from doing so. Prevented from doing so. Now, they were telling me when I arrived in Melbourne yesterday, it's been 11 years since I've been in this church. And it's not because I hadn't wanted to be here. It's not because I hadn't often thought about being here. In fact, every time I get a, a text from them or, or their children, uh, they're praying that I would return. And so I can identify with what Paul is saying here. I was prevented from coming. Now, not necessarily by the devil, but because of my schedule. Uh, you know, I, I travel 21 days out of every month somewhere across the world. And you can just go to so many places in a year's time. In fact, I am making up this year meetings I had to cancel during COVID. And that's the reason why, if you look at my schedule up to now, uh, where I have been traveling all over the world and preaching nearly every night uh, for the last several months, is because I had scheduled to be in these places and was prevented from going because of COVID. In fact, when COVID hit in uh, 2020, March of 2020, I had been in Denver, Colorado, in a, in a very large church there, preaching on Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Then after the service, I got in my airplane and flew home. And the next morning is when 
COVID hit and the pandemic began. And I had to cancel everything. Canceled. Uh, I was headed for, Joe and I were headed for Europe, all over Europe. Had to cancel all of that. We were headed after that for all over Africa. Had to cancel all of that. All the church meetings I was scheduled to be in in the U.S. Had to cancel all of that. I did not leave Crowley, Texas, or Fort Worth, Texas, from March until August of that year. And uh, Brother Copeland, I did some of his virtual victory campaigns at his office, and we'd only have a handful of people in the meeting, and it was basically his television crew. And even though the messages are going out to different uh, places all over the world, we never left Fort Worth from March until August. Then finally I was able to, to schedule or to keep a meeting that was already scheduled for August in a little small community up in Missouri and a small church. And when I arrived there, the place was packed out. I mean, they, they surrounded the building. And my, when they finally turned it over to me, I said, looks like to me you people were glad to get out of the house. <laughs> and we had a great meeting. And then from there, we were able to continue our schedule. So I understand what Paul is saying. I have longed to come to you. I've longed to come back to you but I was prevented from doing so. But praise God, we're here now. Amen. And now I'm here under a different office of ministry, an apostle. So I believe that gives me the right. Don't call me an apostle to your church if I can't speak into your life. Okay, let me try this at the auditorium. <laughs> That's what apostles do, amen? Amen. I mean, I've had, I've had pastors say, Brother Jerry, you're an apostle to our church, and then later find out they get in sin. And I said, now, am I still an apostle to your church? Yes. I said, then you and I need to have a talk. I said, uh, you, need to, you need to leave the pulpit for a season and get restored. Oh, Brother Jerry, I can't do that. Why not? Well, I can't afford to. I said, then I'm not your apostle because the first thing I'm going to suggest you to do is to leave the pulpit for a season because there's sin in your life and you don't come across to the people that there's one set of rules for you and another set of rules for them. Right. Amen? Well, that's when I find out I'm no longer his apostle. <laughs> okay? So, you know, Paul had the privilege of speaking into Timothy's life. He was an apostle to the church that Timothy pastored. In fact, Timothy considered Paul his spiritual father, and, and Paul had to, you know, set things straight from time to time. And one time he even said, stir up the gift that's in you, that came into you by the laying on of my hands. Well, one would he even say that. Apparently, he realized that, that uh, Timothy had become... Uh, preoccupied with people not accepting him for being as young as he was as their pastor. And so Paul had to remind him. He wrote it in his letter to him. Stir up the gift, meaning it's not stirred. Amen? You don't have to tell somebody stir up something if it's already stirred. So he spoke into his life. Now, I'm not here to correct anybody, okay? So take a deep breath. Hallelujah. <laughs> not here to correct anybody. But I am here for the same reason Paul said that he longed to come to this church. Now, when he wrote this letter, he had not been to Rome yet. He had not been to this church in Rome yet. So he's saying to them that I've longed to come to you, but I have been prevented. Now, look at verse 11. For I long to come to you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, you may be established impart into you some spiritual gift. Now, the meaning of this phrase, spiritual gift, from the literal Greek is a grace gift. I've come, or I long to come to you, that I may impart into you a grace gift, or a gift that has been bestowed by the grace of God. Hallelujah. A grace gift. Say that with me. A grace gift. 
a, a gift from a loving God, a gift that he said, Paul said, that to the end will cause you to become established. And that's what God desires for everybody in this building and in the entire body of Christ all over the world. He wants them to become established. He wants them to become strong in faith. And Paul says, the very reason why I am coming to you and when I have the opportunity to come to you is so that I can impart into you a grace gift. Yes. Hallelujah. <coughs> that you might be established. Hallelujah. And then the, the little Greek also implies then when, when that grace gift is imparted, it is accompanied with joy. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So put a smile on your face and say, I'm, I'm getting ready to receive something. Yes. Amen. Look at somebody. Put a smile on your face and say, I'm about to receive something yes. that's going to produce a lot of joy in my life. Yes. Amen. I think you ought to go ahead and thank God in advance for it. <clears throat> Amen. All right. Now, Paul knew that this grace gift would have a great impact on their life and in their walk of faith. And that's the reason why he longed to come to impart it into them. Now, understand this. You can't impart into somebody else something that you don't have yourself. Amen. Would that be correct? I can't impart into you something that I don't have myself, that God has imparted into me. So Paul apparently had something they needed, a grace gift on his life that he was able to impart. This is all over the Bible. You can see this principle, and we'll take a look at some of the examples as we continue on. So when I heard how that you guys, for the lack of a better phrase, that's the way we talk in Texas, you know, when I began hearing how that you guys here in Melbourne seem to have been under more restrictions than even the rest of your nation and most of the world. Now, one of the first places that COVID hit extremely hard was the nation of Italy. And I, I go to Italy every year. And I was, and I was scheduled to be in Italy when, when it hit, and uh, we were not able to go. In fact, we still haven't been to Italy yet. Uh, we're, we're making that up here before long. But they were hit hard. They, were, they, they lived under a lot of constriction, uh, restrictions, just like most of you did right here in Melbourne. I'd get a uh, text from the Lewis family that... That whole family, their whole family had to move into one house. Nine of you. I prayed for you immediately. <laughs> I, I How long were you all together in one house? Seven months. In the second lockdown, five months. Seven months in the first lockdown, five months in the second lockdown. Y'all still love each other? <laughs> Yeah, okay. And uh, so when I would hear things like that, I would, I would pray and, and pray specific, specifically for the grace of God on them to handle all of that, you know. And that's, not, that's not hard. I mean, that's not easy. That's hard. Uh, I love my family. I love my daughters. I love my son-in-laws. I love my grandchildren. I love my great-grandchildren. I don't want them with me seven months. <laughs> One of the great things about being a grandfather is you can love on them, fill them up with sugar, and send them home. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let them get hyper with the par parents on the sugar rush I gave them, you know. <laughs> back, to back home, they call me El, uh, Papa, El Shaddai Papa. I'm the grandfather who does exceeding, abundant above all they can ask or think. <laughs> Every year when they get out of school, particularly when, and we still have some young ones, but when they were, the older ones were much younger then. Uh, every year when they'd get out of school, as soon as that they got out, that last day of school, then we would take them to our lake house. That's about 40 miles from Fort Worth. And we'd spend two weeks with them, just me and Carolyn, 
and no parents allowed. <laughs> Would not allow the parents to come. And we just did everything they wanted to do. And, uh, and I love water sports. and We'd be on the lake with them and everything. And then at night, uh, we'd, 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 go the, we'd go to the grocery store and buy everything they wanted. <laughs> everything they wanted. And then we'd come back at night after being on the lake. And, and it was their job to surprise me and Mimi with stuff they would make. And that was a faith endeavor, you know. <laughs> but one of the things they always liked was we'd, we'd go and buy all these flavors of ice cream yeah. and all these toppings. Yeah. Oh, uh, toppings I never even heard of. And they would make me and Mimi a sundae, they would call it, an ice cream sundae, and put everything <laughs> you can imagine on top of it. And they'd invent new stuff the next night <laughs> for two weeks, you know. And then when it was time for them to go home, we loved them. Oh, we loved having them with us. But we could hardly wait to get them out of the house, you know. <laughs> and then we would rest for another three days, you know. <laughs> so I love that. I love being with my family, you know, and love being with those special times. But seven months <laughs> and then another five months? Were you guys ready to get out of the house? <laughs> Amen. But anyway, I'm just using that as an example of, of some of the things I heard that was happening here in Melbourne. So obviously, uh, I, I prayed for you, even though I don't know all of you, but I prayed for the believers in Melbourne. And uh, our prayer department prays for, uh, prays for you, and specifically our partners all over the world, partners here in Australia. And just like the Apostle Paul, I long to be with you in physical presence when the time was right. And that's why we're here this time. Now, I did not know when I scheduled to be here that at that time they were praying about and planning on asking us to become affiliated with Heritage Faith Ministerial Association. And also, I did not know at that time that they were going to announce that I am an apostle to this church. So, with that in mind, I, I'm glad that we scheduled this trip. I'm glad I'm here tonight, and I'm glad I have this opportunity to come physically because apparently what Paul wanted to impart to them could not be done in a letter. It had to be a physical presence. It couldn't be done. Many of you received my partner letters uh, you know, individual, personal letters. And, and this impartation cannot come in just a letter. That's the reason why he wanted to be there physically. And so he says, I long to come to you to impart this grace gift so that your faith will become stronger. So that's what I'm here for. Amen. I, I'm going to tell you this uh, before I finish this. Um, some of you may have heard this on a tape, or a tape, a <laughs> recording. <laughs> That's, that, that ages me, praise God. And so uh, uh, many years ago, I, I've been a sports enthusiast all my life. I was an athlete growing up. Uh, I had ambitions to play professional baseball. I got as far as a farm league team sponsored by the Kansas City Royals. Never did make the majors. But I, I played baseball all my young life. I know it's not a big sport over here, but that was my, my best sport. I, I was a gymnast as well. I was involved in gymnastics, swimming, boxing. I love sports. And uh, I still love sports, even though I don't get to participate as I used to. But I still love watching them on television when I'm home. And particularly boxing. I love boxing. Oh, I love boxing. I love boxing. <laughs> you got the message now? My dad boxed in the Navy uh, in World War II. Uh, he taught me to box when, as a young boy. Uh, I boxed in college, uh, and I've had the privilege of mentoring several professional boxers that I've gone to training camp with, and when they get through training, I do Bible studies with them. And so uh, I love being around sports. Well, this one particular year, I was home, 
and the NBA Finals a championship was taking place. And uh, I, I very seldom get to watch any NBA games during the course of the year because I'm always gone. But sometimes I'm home when the championship games are going on. And this particular year, one of our Texas teams, the San Antonio Spurs, were in the championship game. And the team they were playing uh, has won many championships in the past. And so not many people were giving San Antonio much of a chance to win the championship. But as it turned out, they did. And it surprised a lot of, you know, sports uh, authorities. And so I got to watch that final game where they won the, the championship. Now, you know, you've noticed that it's very seldom they ever take uh, the microphone into the losing locker room. <laughs> and so they obviously went into the locker room of the San Antonio Spurs. And the guys were sitting on the bench. They just won the championship. A lot of celebrating going on. And they walked up to one guy, one of the major players, and put the microphone in his face and said, how did you guys win this championship? Nobody gave you any hope of winning the championship. I was surprised, the guy said, that you won the championship. Now, the guy was about six foot seven, and he stood up and towered over this guy and looked down at him and said, it's what we do, man. It's what we do. I thought, that'll preach, praise God. I'm always, I'm always listening for a, a, a theme for a sermon, you know. That, that's what we do, man. It's what we do. So anyway, I'm using that to say to you tonight, I have come to impart a spiritual gift, a grace gift. It's what I do, man. It's what I do. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's get into this uh, study, and then we'll talk about that gift that is to be imparted. Now, I want to read from the Passion Translation, Romans 1.11. I yearn to come and to be face to face with you and get to know you, for I long to impart to you some spiritual gift that will empower you to stand strong in your faith. I love that. That will empower you to stand strong in your faith. Now, listen to that again. To impart into you a spiritual gift that will empower you to stand strong in your faith. So how many of you in here tonight could stand a little reinforcement in your faith, praise God, particularly in the times in which we live today. Now, you know as well as I do that 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So our method of victory over any adversity and every challenge that we might face is through faith, through our faith. And praise God, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that God has given to every man, talking about believers, the measure of faith. So we have been given by God faith that enables us to overcome the world. But every once in a while, you need it shored up. Every once in a while, you need it, uh, you need some, in, some encouragement. Uh, I've, asked, I've had people ask me many times over the years, Brother Jerry, what do you believe is your primary assignment in the body of Christ? And I've answered it the same way all these years. Talk people into winning. That's, that's my job. It's what I do, man. It's what I do. Talk people into winning. Because a lot of times uh, when you're going through a lot of adversity and it's been going on for a long time, a long duration, you know, you, you kind of feel uh, isolated. You feel like, man, I don't know if I can stand any longer. Having done all to stand and stand, you think I've done that as long as I think I can. I don't know if I could continue. So you just need some words of encouragement. Sometimes all it needs is just a pat on the back. You can make it. You can do it. You can do this. Don't give up. God's, God's working behind the scenes. Amen. Brother Hagin used to say, if you're prepared to stand forever, then it won't take very long. But a lot of people are not prepared to stand forever. They put a duration on the time that they're going to stand. I'm going to give God two weeks. Well, it's not likely you'll see anything happen in two weeks because you just invited the devil to prevent it from happening. 
Amen. No, your attitude should be, I'm prepared to stand forever. Amen. And I believe God's going to see to it. It won't take very long. Praise Amen. God. Amen. So notice here, he says that faith is our method of victory over everything that Satan throws against us. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 14, Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always. Everybody say always. always. Now, you may not be triumphant at this very moment, but God's Word says He causes you to triumph always. Amen. So that means it's not over yet. Yes. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not over yet. Don't give up. Tell them, don't give up. Don't Amen. So here he's telling us that I have come to impart into you this grace gift so that your faith will become stronger. Amen. And everybody needs their faith to become stronger. I don't, I don't care who you are and how long you've been in this and how long you've been preaching or whatever. Everybody needs their faith to continue to grow strong. And how is that? happen. Primarily, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. Amen. That's the reason why uh, I go to meetings like this, where I'm not doing the preaching, and particularly with people that I know and I have confidence in, and I know they preach the Word of faith. I'm not going someplace where they tell me, God's my problem. Right. Brother Copeland and I were invited many years ago to a minister's conference uh, in Washington, D.C., had about 2,000 preachers from every denomination you can imagine. And we were the only two that were invited to represent the word of faith. In fact, I later found out we were just a token so that they could say, even the word of faith boys were with us, you know. And so we went to the opening ceremony, the opening service. I'm telling you, I never heard such unbelief in all my life. And, and people were shouting over it. And Brother Copeland looked down at me and he said, is there something wrong with us? I said, apparently so. I'm, I, we're the only two that's not excited about unbelief. He said, you want to stay here? I said, not really. I said, I haven't spent all these years building my faith and allow some guy to destroy it in one hour. I said, what do you want to do? He said, let's go eat. <laughs> I said, okay. So we got up and left and Went and had a nice meal. And, and, and then he said, what do you want to do now? I said, well, go to your room or come to mine. Just preach to each other. Because <laughs> that's what we do every time we're together, praise God. And so we did. We just went to one of the others. I think they came to, he came to my room. And we just sat up and preached to each other. And, of course, you do know Brother Copeland did most of the preaching. <laughs> Okay, And so anyway, we just, man, by the time we went to bed, we were pumped with faith. Yeah. Amen. So one of the ways, primary ways that your faith is strengthened and your faith is, 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 uh, uh, grows is by continually hearing the word. Notice Paul didn't say faith came by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Hearing and hearing, repetition. You can never hear it enough. That's the reason why, in that briefcase right here, I'll even get it out and show you. It's a show and tell night. <laughs> this little deal right here, my wife says, You got more bags than anybody I know. You got a bag for your bags. I don't know if they even still make these things. An iPod. I got this years ago. Somebody blessed me with it. Now, I don't have the first clue of how to download stuff on it. <laughs> but I know how to believe God for people who do. <laughs> okay. So I got people in my office that are, you know, they're, they're tech savvy, so to speak. And I, I went in one day. And I took my box full of Kenneth Hagin reel-to-reel tapes 
Kenneth Copeland reel-to-reel tapes, Oral Roberts reel-to-reel tapes, T.L. Osborne's reel-to-reel tapes, and then I also added Charles Capps cassette tapes, uh, Fred Price cassette tapes, John Osteen cassette tapes. I said, I want all of that downloaded on this, and I want it by Friday when I leave for uh, Nairobi, Kenya. They stayed up all night downloaded. I've got close to 2,500 messages on this little thing. And it goes everywhere I go. And some of my favorites to this day are messages I heard Kenneth Hagin preach when I was less than a year old in the Lord. And I still listen to them today. I can preach them word for word. In fact, many of them, I was in the meeting when he preached it. I've been in meetings with Brother Hagin. And, and traveled with him and preached in meetings with him. And there were times when Brother Hagin said, uh, Brother Jerry, come, come finish this. <laughs> I knew exactly where it was headed. I knew the story that was coming up with it. In fact, I listened to Kenneth Hagin so much, I felt like I was born in McKinney, Texas, <laughs> where he was born, you know. And, 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 and I take them everywhere, okay? Now, traveling around the world, you know, from from here, oh, Jesus, <laughs> 17 hours. Joe and I decided since we couldn't come in our airplane, we were doing some maintenance and inspections on it, we flew commercial, and we decided, well, let's just fly to L.A. for the night, spend the night, and then fly the rest of the way. Well, that only cut the time down three hours, <laughs> you know. Got here in 14 hours. Hallelujah. <laughs> Nonstop. You can listen to a lot of messages in 14 hours. And sometimes I forget that I'm on a commercial airline, and I forget there's other people sitting around me. And they'll say something on here, and I'll get excited, and I like sitting in the bulkhead. Sometimes I'm kicking the bullhead, bull, 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 or whatever. I'm kicking it, the bulkhead. And I'm shouting. And sometimes, I've had this actually happen. The flight attendant come and say, are you okay? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I, I forgot I was on a commercial airline. I, I fly private aircraft most of the time. And I can shout whenever I want to on my airplane. <laughs> you know? And she said, well, what are you listening to that's got you so excited? I said, the Word of God. She said, I've never found anything exciting about the Word of God. I said, you listening to the wrong yeah. people. <laughs> Maybe. So notice, here I am. I am 54 years of living by faith, and I'm still listening to the Word. And I listen to it like I've never heard it before. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And I need strong faith every day of my life. Every day of my life. Amen. So that's one of the primary ways that our faith grows. So Paul says, I long to come to you that I might impart into you this grace gift so that in the end, your faith will be established. Anybody want their faith established? Hallelujah. Okay, let's continue. Now, another word for impart is confer, to confer. Another word is to bestow or to place in, or to place upon. To, to impart is to confirm, to bestow, to place in, or to place upon. Now, Paul said to Timothy, as I mentioned earlier, in 2 Timothy 1.6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee, and notice Paul says how it came, by the laying on of my hands. So notice a spiritual gift came into Timothy when Paul laid hands on him. That's why Paul is saying, I long to come to you, because that gift could not be imparted in a letter. He had to be there physically for that impartation to take place. Okay? Are you still with me? Yeah. Now, in the Passion Translation, it says, uh, to stir up the gift of God, that was imparted into you when I laid my hands upon you. When I laid my hands upon you. So Paul had to remind him that a gift had already been imparted 
but apparently Timothy is now allowing it to lie dormant. You can do that. I, I remember when I was a young boy, I have a sister that's four years younger than me, and my sister wanted to learn to play the piano. And so uh, she asked my mother if she could take piano lessons. So mom found some a teacher in our neighborhood and took Shirley over there to learn to play piano. But we didn't have a piano in our home. And so Shirley couldn't practice in between lessons. And so she kept begging my mom and dad to buy a piano. And they kept saying, Shirley, we don't know if you're committed. We don't know if you're going to stick with this. And we don't have the money to waste on a piano that's going to sit in the loo room and not be played. Oh, mom, I promise. She promised and promised. I'll, I promise I'll practice. So they found a nice used piano and bought it and put it in the living room there. And when she would come home from the lesson, then she would practice what she had been taught. Now, when she would leave and when my mom and dad would take her somewhere and I might be left at home and nobody else was around, I would walk in there in that living room and sit at that piano and try to, because I could hear her from my bedroom uh, practicing. And I'd try to pick out what I heard her do. And much to my surprise, after a little while, I, I picked it out. I guess you call that playing by ear, okay? And I'd pick it out. But as soon as they came back, as I, I heard a car drive up, I'd look out the window, and I'd go back to my bedroom. Now, the reason being is because when I was growing up, and, I, and this is stupid, I'll admit this is stupid, but in our neighborhood, Boys didn't play pianos. Now I don't know if that I don't know if the word is used over here, but back in the South, particularly where I grew up, a boy that played a piano was referred to as a sissy. Yes. Is that a word yes. you use over here? Yes. Sometimes I use words that we use at home and find out the country I used it in, that's a bad word. <laughs> I have cussed in other languages <laughs> and didn't know I did it. You know? <laughs> and so, anyway, uh, my best friend, Kenny Henner, lived across the street from me, and we were the same age. And I did not want Kenny catching me at that piano because I knew it was a fight. Because <laughs> he'd call me a sissy. And so one day, I'm in there, you know, picking out something on the piano, and Kenny walked in without me knowing he was there. Back then, we didn't even lock our doors. I mean, we everybody on the street knew each other, and his mama was like another mama to me. My mother was like another mother. We we just we just was in and out of how, each other's house all the time. Didn't have to have an invitation. Didn't even knock. Just walk in. It's just the way it was. And so Kenny surprised me. He walked in, and I didn't know he was in the room. And when he saw me sitting there at that piano, he said, "You sissy." I jumped up and hit him right in the mouth. <laughs> and we we wrestled out in my front yard. We wrestled over in the street. We wrestled all over into his front yard. And I never touched that piano again. And now, when I look at these guys, and particularly Jesse DePlantis, yes. Jesse can play about seven different instruments. And every time we go to their house, we make him give us a private concert. He has a beautiful grand piano in his living room, one of a kind. In fact, Pavarotti heard that he had this piano and had one of his people call Jesse's office and ask if he could, his pianist could come and play Jesse's piano. And Pavarotti said, and I'll come and give you a private concert in your home. So they set it up, but Pavarotti died before it could take place. But that's the kind of piano Jesse has. And Jesse can play anything from Jerry Lee Lewis to Beethoven. So we, we sit there in the living room, like, you know, a little <laughs> cup of tea, and let Jesse, <laughs> Jesse give us a, a concert. You know, and he'll start off with, you know, Beethoven, and then he'll work his way down to, wow, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know. <laughs> 
And, and I'm sitting there looking at him and listening to him, and I just want to slap him. <laughs> but more than slap him, I want to find Kenny Hennard and slap him. Why? Because there might have been potential there, and I let some foolish thing rob me of it. And I've never, I've never tried to play the piano again. So what I'm using that as an illustration is you can have a gift and let it lie dormant. Amen. And apparently that's what Timothy was doing because Paul said, stir up the gift that came into you when I laid hands on you. So apparently Timothy, for whatever reason, intimidation, fear, uh, whatever. And we do know he wrestled with being so young as a pastor. And so uh, Paul is encouraging him there was a gift imparted to you when I came. Now stir it up. That gift was designed to strengthen his faith, as he said in Romans chapter 1. So once again, to impart is to confirm, to bestow, to place in, and to place upon. Now, let's take a look. You got time? Let's take a look at what gift Paul was referring to that he had that was capable of being imparted. Okay? Now, the Bible does say that, that there are various gifts. Not everybody has the same gifts. And they're given as God wills. You don't choose the gift. It's something that God imparts into you. I didn't choose the gift that I have functioning in me. God imparted it into me, okay? So let's find out what kind of gift Paul is referring to. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Everybody still here? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, this is good. I'm so glad you came. I only teach this when I'm received as an apostle in a church. Now, verse 12. First Timothy. Chapter 1. And beginning in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Now look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the Amplified Version says it this way. And the grace, and most of the time, when you see the word grace in the Amplified, if you keep reading, it will define grace as unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And that's the way it reads in the Amplified here. And the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of our Lord actually flowed out on me superabundantly and beyond measure. Superabundantly and beyond measure. Now, every believer has a measure of grace. But Peter and Paul, both, in some of their letters, they talked about how that grace can be multiplied or increased, that you can, you can experience higher levels of it. And here the Apostle Paul says that God had bestowed upon him superabundant and beyond measure grace and favor. Now, I can identify with that. Because that's the gifting that God has bestowed upon me. And some of you have heard me talk about this. When I first came to the Lord in 1969, I was less than three months on the, in the Lord. And I'd get up every morning and, and spend my first several hours just praying in the Spirit and studying the Word. And, uh, and because I knew very little about the Word, uh, I had a, a, a tape player set on my credenza with reel-to-reel -reel tapes from Kenneth Hagin, or Kenneth Copeland. I did not know 
and had not heard of Kenneth Hagin at that time. But every time I'd listen to Brother Copeland, he'd mention something about Kenneth Hagin. And so I thought, well, if Kenneth Copeland listens to this Kenneth Hagin, then whenever I have the opportunity, I want to hear Kenneth Hagin. So I would go in there and I would pray in the spirit for the first couple of hours and just fellowship with the Lord. And then I'd start studying the word. And one morning the Lord said to me, I want you to, I want you to uh, write and journal everything I say to you. and Keep it in a journal. Now I've done that for 54 years now. And all these previous journals are in my archives. And so uh, that particular morning, I wrote the date. It's 1969. The Lord said to me, I'm going to teach you how to walk in my favor. And then I'm going to hold you responsible for teaching others how to walk in it as you do. He said, there will come a day when your name will be known around the world for the favor of God that's on your life. Now, I wrote that in the journal, okay? But I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't even tell my wife. I mean, you don't go around saying when you're less than three months old in the Lord, guess what? My name's going to be known around the world for the favor of God. I wrote it in fear and trembling, okay? And, and I didn't know anything about the favor of God. I didn't even know it existed. I'd never heard anybody mention that term, never heard anybody preach it, never read anything about it. And the Lord said, I'm going to teach you how to walk in my favor, and then I'll hold you responsible for teaching others how to walk in it as you do, and there will come a time when your name will be known around the world for the favor of God that's on your life. Well, that didn't happen overnight or the first year and then the first few years. But today, my name is known around the world for the favor of God that's on my life. Amen. And I can identify with the Apostle Paul. It is on my life super abundant and beyond measure. Now, you ask anybody that knows me well, the favor of God shows, in my, shows up in my life every day. In some way. In fact, since I've been in Australia, the favor of God has manifested uh, in some way every day since I've been here. I expected to do so from the time I leave. I expected to do so on my way home. I expect to do so when I get home. And I, I expected to do so every day of my life. Why? Because it's super abundant and beyond measure on me. It's it's much like a an athlete who is extremely gifted in the sport that he plays. Okay? Now, when I was young and playing baseball, I started in Little League. You started about 9 or 10 years old. And I'm left-handed, and they found out I could pitch. And so I, I began playing baseball as a pitcher. And as I grew up, uh, that's, that was my position. I played that position all the way up to that farm league team. And I, I, being left-handed, you have a natural curve. And then I had a, a good fastball and won a lot of championships, won a lot of awards playing baseball all my young life. So you could say that the, uh, having the ability to pitch with some people, like uh, uh, I have friends that are professional baseball players, some of whom are pitchers, and, and some of whom... Uh, break records all uh, nearly every year they play. I would say about them, they have this ability super abundant and beyond measure on them. Okay? You know, they're, they're, you guys, well, you play soccer, po uh, rugby. Is that, that what you play here? Australian. Say what? <laughs> Australian. Australian rules football. <laughs> Okay. That's Rugby. Rugby. Okay. I know I was in. Oh, okay. Now we got a competition going in. I see. I understand. Some place is called one thing. Some place is called another. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know one time I was in England and somebody brought me a, a professional soccer uniform, you know, and I decided to wear it one day. And the next church I was going to, they booed me. 
That's like, you know, being a Dallas Cowboy fan and you walk out in a Green Bay Packer shirt. <laughs> Amen. Even though I'm, I live in Texas, uh, and I do like the Cowboys, but I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. <laughs> and Gloria Copeland saw me in a Green Bay Packer shirt. She said, traitor. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some people, even in the natural realm, that have certain gifts in their life and on their life that's super abundant beyond measure. And that's why they excel in that. Yeah. Amen. Well, the same is true in spiritual gifts. There are some gifts, grace gifts, yeah. that God bestows on individuals, and they excel in that gift. That's the story of my life with the favor of God. Amen. I like to say it this way. It's on me big time. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not trying to be boastful or egotistical. I'm not that kind of person. But I'm not denying the fact that it's on me. And, and it's not just recognized by me. It's recognized by people all over the world. In fact, a lot of places I go, they don't, they don't introduce me as Brother Jerry. Uh, Dr. Favor, would you come? <laughs> Brother Favor, would you come? You know, Reverend Favor, would you come? In fact, are there any, are there any, People in here that like hip hop music. Well, I've never cared that much for hip hop, but there's a man back home. His name is is uh, Terry Minor, and Terry Minor heard me preach on favor, and he's a hip hop artist, and he wrote a song. It's, you can listen to it on YouTube. It's called the Favor Flow, <laughs> and there's a line at the beginning. And I mean, he <clears throat> he goes through the you know, the moves. I'm trying to learn the moves, you know. <clears throat> and I've had him sing it at our church. I've had him sing it in some of our motorcycle rallies, and people love it, particularly young people. And at the beginning of the song, he says, "I want favor like Jerry Savelle." <laughs> Sing the song. Yeah. Now, how many people are writing songs about you? Yeah. Check it out on YouTube. Listen to it tonight before you go to bed. In fact, you won't be able to sit still. You'll be doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me the favor flow. In fact, Terry wants the favor of God on his life. It's not just in a song. Just like it's on my life, he moved to Fort Worth to be in our church. Because wow, okay. he heard me preach, increase by association. Amen. So, I have the favor of God on my life, and I would describe it as super abundant and beyond measure. Hallelujah. And that's what I've come to impart into you. Amen. 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 It can be imparted, a portion of it. You're not getting it all. I need it. <laughs> now, let's go to Numbers chapter 27. And see this as a Bible principle. And I'm not just making this up. <clears throat> Verse 18 of Numbers 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Now, we're going to recognize as we see this that the predominant way that a spiritual gift, a grace gift, is imparted is by the laying on of hands. That's why Paul wanted to be in Rome. Because he couldn't do it in a letter. He needed to be physically there. And now it goes on to say, And set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him. You will put some of the honor I put on you, Moses. You'll put some of it on him. And how he was going to do this? By the laying on of hands. And he said, Thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Look at verse 22. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And verse 23 says, And he laid his hands upon him, and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. 
Now, let's see if anything happened as a result of that. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. And look at verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. So notice an impartation came into Joshua when Moses laid his hands upon him. A gift that was in Moses has now, a portion of it has been imparted, conferred upon, bestowed upon Joshua. Amen. And did it make Joshua strong? Yes, it did. Because Joshua is going to succeed Moses in getting the children of Israel into uh, the promised land. And he needed that gifting in order to do it. That's the reason God had Moses to do so. Amen. You're going to need the spirit of favor on your life for the rest of your life like never before. This, this world is not getting any better. And there are some things that you and I will be faced with in the days to come that nothing else will get us over except the favor of God. You need a... I love that. Echo, echo, echo. You need the favor of God increased like never before. So this is... Uh, a very special moment for us all. Hallelujah. And I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad I'm here. Amen. Now, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. You all know the story of Elijah and Elijah. Verse 19 says, So he departed thence and found Elijah, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Okay? So this is his first introduction to Elijah. And so he cast his mantle upon him. But what happened? Did something take place? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Breaking in a new Bible and the pages are sticking. And you know the story without us taking the time to read it all. It's now time for Elijah to be taken up. And he tells Elijah to stay in a certain city. Or Elijah to stay in a certain city. And he says, as the Lord thy God liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Why was that so important to him? Because there was something on Elijah that Elijah desired to come on him. Amen? And so he said, I will not leave thee. So he went with him. They came to him the second city. Elijah said, stay here. He said, as the Lord thy God liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So he went with him again. The third time, as the Lord thy God liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Okay? Now it's time for Elijah to be taken up in a whirlwind. And this is where we pick up the story. He says in verse 6, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord thy God liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they went on. Verse 8, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. What's he asking for? An impartation. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. 
and Elijah saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Now, why was that important? Because he'd asked the prophet, I want a double portion of your anointing. I won't impart it into me what God imparted into you, but I'm asking for a double portion of it. Yeah. And, of course, Elijah told him what it would take to, to receive that. He picked up that mantle, and the first thing he did was walk over to the Jordan and see if he got the impartation he desired. And he smote the river, and it parted just like it had done for Elijah. He's now knowing that I got what I asked for. I received the impartation that I desired. And if you keep reading the story of Elijah, you will see the Bible records exactly twice as many miracles as it records under the ministry of Elijah. Amen. So this is a biblical principle. It's a spiritual law. Amen. Now we see that uh, uh, the message translation says, Elijah said unto him, your life, I mean, Elijah said unto Elijah, I'm asking that your life be repeated in me. That that same anointing that was on you come on me, but a double portion. So we see from the Bible that a transferring of anointings, transferring of, a, of giftings can certainly take place when God so desires. Now, the Bible also says in Proverbs 13, 20, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The Lord said to me when I first read that, way back there in 1969, he said, every time you come across this verse, you referred to it as the law of increase by association. The law of increase by association. You walk with wise men, you'll gain in wisdom. You'll increase in wisdom. You walk with anointed men, you'll increase in the anointing. You walk with prosperous people, you'll increase in your prosperity. You walk with people who are highly favored by God. Duh. You'll increase in the favor of God. Amen. Now, I've had the privilege of my four mentors having laid hands on me while three of them don't know to be with the Lord, but while they were still here in the earth, lay hands on me and impart a portion of their anointings. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, Oral Roberts, and T.L. Osborne, my four mentors. And the moment they laid hands on me, I said out loud, I receive a portion of their anointings. Amen. From Kenneth Hagan, I received the spirit of faith. From Kenneth Copeland, I received the ability to prosper beyond world natural means by God's laws of prosperity. Through Oral Roberts came healing and miracles. Through T.L. Osborne, world evangelism. Amen. Those giftings are in me. In fact, when I lay hands on people, they don't benefit from just my anointing. They benefit from four other anointings, four primary anointings. There's other men that have laid hands on me, Lester Summerall, John Osteen, uh, men of, of, of great faith. But those four mentors, I tell people, when I lay hands on you, you're not just receiving a portion of my anointing, but you're receiving a portion of their anointing as well. It's, it'll go from generation to generation. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I believe every word of it. Praise God. Okay. Now, Brother Hagin used to say, and I wrote this phrase down exactly the way he used to say it. Be careful who you associate with because you can imbibe their spirit. You can imbibe their spirit. And the word imbibe means to take in, to absorb, and to cause to become one with. That's the reason a lot of times when you hear about 
a pastor falling or getting into sin, it's not unlikely many times, not every time, that the associates will follow. They imbibed his spirit. Well, if you could imbibe the spirit in a negative way, why not in a positive way? Yes. Amen. I have imbibed poor Robert's spirit. In fact, Brother Roberts called me one time and asked me to come to, to uh, uh, Oral Roberts University, and he wanted me to, to do a session, uh, three sessions with his staff. All of the professors at the university, staff at Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association. And he said, now I'm not, I'm not telling you why I've asked you to come specifically. I just want you to do and say what God gives you, then I'll let you know if you heard from God. Now, thank you. <laughs> That's what he calls an oral exam. <laughs> okay. So I went up there to, to speak to his staff. And, and as I was praying before I went, I sensed in my spirit the reason he wanted me to come is because most of his employees, most of the professors at ORU at that time did not have oral spirit. It was just a job. It's just to get a paycheck. And so he had several of them come up and just share a little bit before I, he turned the service to me. And I'm, as I'm listening to them, I, not, I did not hear one of them say anything about healing and miracles. I did not hear one of them say anything about one of Brother Robert's most famous books and most famous teachings is the law, uh, the miracle of seed time, the miracle of seed faith, rather. Nobody talked about seed faith. Nobody talked about healing and miracles. And God told Oral Roberts when he built that university, build it on this principle. Seed time, the, 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 the law of seed faith and healing and miracles. And I didn't hear one staff member, one professor mention that at all. So when I got up, I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been invited here by Dr. Roberts. He asked me to say to you whatever the Lord gave me. And I'm very sorry to say, and it grieves my spirit, that I didn't hear one person who spoke this morning who has Oral Roberts' spirit. Brother Roberts got up and said, that's enough. That's what I wanted to hear you say. You can all go back to work now. That's what he wanted to hear. You don't have my spirit. Now, notice it says, he that walketh with wise men. It didn't say he that worketh with wise men. You can work with somebody and not imbibe their spirit. I've had a lot of people that work in my ministry that never, never received my giftings. Because they only worked with me. They didn't walk with me. There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. The word walketh here means to follow a course of action. In other words, you live by the same principles I live by. That's what I did with Brother Copeland when I was working with him. I, I not only listened to him preach, but I acted on the same principles that he and Gloria acted on. They were our examples. The Bible says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We saw them experiencing fulfillment of the promises in their life. We did exactly what they, learned, they did, what they taught us, and we got the same results. Amen. In fact, many times when I'd go preach somewhere, uh, I had one pastor say, um, you're just a Kenneth Copeland clone. I didn't even know what a clone was. I had to go look at a dictionary and see what a clone was. <laughs> He said, you're just a Kenneth Copeland clone. Why don't you get your own message? And so I came home from that meeting, and uh, Brother Copeland called me and said, let's, let's go uh, have some fellowship. And he said, where did you, you just come from? I said, Oklahoma City. He said, where were you preaching? I told him the church. He said, who's the pastor there? I told him the pastor. And he said, uh, he just kind of grinned. I said, you know what that pastor told me? He told me I was a Kenneth Copeland clone, and I needed to get my own message. He said, 
He told me the same thing the first time I preached there. He told me I was a Kenneth Hagin clone, and I needed to get my own message. He said, I am not going to get my own message because this one worketh. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So you can imbibe someone's spirit. Also, this is important, and then we'll pray. You don't have to know somebody to have an association with them. I was associated with Kenneth Hagin before I ever met the man. How? Through his resources. I was associated with Oral Roberts before I ever met the man. How? Through his resources. I was associating with T.L. Osborne before I ever had uh, met him. How? Through his resources. Over a period of time, then I was privileged to meet them and become friends with them, and preach with them, and serve in various boards with them. But that was that that was not when I began my association with them. That was just, you know, fringe benefit, so to speak. But I started associating with them if, long before I ever met them. You don't, you don't have to go home with me to associate with me. Follow the same course that I'm on. Follow the same teachings that I teach. Amen. Build your faith on the same biblical doctrines that I build mine on, praise God. That forms an association. So, how many of you are ready to receive an impartation? Yeah. Now, let me just close it out with this. Be careful, because it says, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, be not deceived, Evil communications corrupt good manners. The Amplified Bible says, evil, evil companionships or associations corrupt good character. So it's important that you associate with the right people. I've learned over the years that who you associate with has everything to do with how your life turns out. Amen? So tonight I have come as the Apostle Paul said, to impart a grace gift. And that grace gift that's on me is super abundant beyond measure favor. And you're going to need that for the rest of your life. As I said, this crazy world is not getting any easier to live in. And there's some things that you and I will face in the days ahead that it's only through the favor of God that you will make it and you will overcome. So are you ready to receive? Yes. Amen. So once again, we've, we've discovered that the way that an impartation primarily comes is by the laying on of hands. I have laid hands on as many as 5,000 people in one service, one at a time, in a church that receives me as an apostle to that church. I preached this message to them and laid hands on them. And within two weeks, I was getting testimonies of some of the most astounding manifestations of the favor of God that I'd ever heard. Amen. You got time for one of them? This one man that I laid hands on in this church, the pastor called me the following week and said, this family has just had the greatest miracle they've ever had and it affected causing a, one of the greatest miracles this church has ever had. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, you laid hands on this man. And this man and his family got saved in our church many years ago. They followed our teachings. They followed yours and Brother Copeland's teaching, Brother Hagin's teaching. And said, when you laid hands on him, he went home that night. And he said, no, Lord, I've received an impartation. So what can I expect from it? And he said the man was in great need financially. And he said the Lord said to him, you have something that your parents gave you before they passed away, and it's just been in a, in a, in a box in the attic of your house. Go get it. So he went up in the attic, got this box out, and found uh, some... Uh, 
we call it. Treasury notes or something. Anyway, stock. That's the word I'm looking for. Found some stock that his parents had bought many years before. And they passed it on to him. But when he took it to a person that could tell him what it was worth, he said, it's really not even worth the paper that it's written on. But just hold on to it. It might be worth something someday. He said, the Lord told him, he said, it's worth something now. He took it and sold it and brought the pastor the tithe from it. And the tithe was $1.2 million. <laughs> Amen. He sold some stock that was worthless and wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. But God, through the favor of God, caused it to become worth $12 million. And he brought the pastor the same week a check for $1.2 million. Amen. We need, more, we need more people like that in our church. Amen. Now, a lot of people, if they just received $12 million, all the pastor would get is a postcard from the Bahamas. I'm believing that more people are going to be able to write $1.2 million checks. Amen. You missed a good opportunity saying, I'll be one of them, praise God. Now, I'm not promising you next week you'll have $12 million in the bank. I am promising you your level of favor that you came with in here tonight is going to be higher when you walk out of here, praise God. And favor can do what nothing else can do. Hallelujah. So can we move this out of the way? And we're going to organize this and be able to do it decently in order. And uh, Joe, you want to come up and tell them what to do? We'll lay hands. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. In fact, if nobody participates, I'm going to lay hands on myself and get a double portion, praise God. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm doing this for you. I already have it. And I want to import, impart a portion like Moses was told to do for Joshua. A portion. Hallelujah. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to start over here. And from all the way back, you're going to go all the way to the side. And you're going to come down. And you're going to come across. And you come back up this row to your seats. So just this. Nothing here yet. So once this, you'll, they'll get you started. You'll go over. You'll come up. You'll come by. Brother Jerry will lay his hands on you. So he's going to be standing right about here. Once he does, you go back up the aisle to your, to your seat, okay? He's not going to try to have a word for you, maybe. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. That's not what it's for. It's just the impartation of laying hands on you for what he just told you. And then when that's done, then we'll start working with this section. And what you'll do is you'll start on this section where the aisle is. You'll work your way over to this aisle. You'll come down, and then you'll go back up and take your seats. And again, I'll move Brother Jerry over. He'll lay hands on you. You'll go back up right to your seats. Then I'll come over on that side, and we'll work from the back again, and we'll work all the way through. No, no complications. It'll go smooth. Amen. Everybody got it? So I want this group to stand up, and you're going to start at the back. So you're going to go that direction, okay? Caitlin, help him over there. No, you're going to wait, okay? This is going to work from the back to the front. And Brother Jerry, I'm going to have you stand right here. Start with the pastors. Okay. And I'm going to pray this general prayer for everybody so I don't have to pray it over and over again individually. So the moment I say amen, I want everybody in here to say, I receive it. Say it out loud where you can hear yourself say it. Father, in the name of Jesus, in obedience to the command of the Holy Spirit, I lay my hands upon every individual in this place tonight who desire it. And I am believing, just like what was recorded and we saw in the book of Romans tonight, 
that an impartation of a spiritual gift, a grace gift, that I personally, through you, possess in my life and am capable of imparting a portion of it into others' lives. And that's what we're expecting to take place tonight. A portion of superabundant, of beyond measure favor coming upon them, added to the favor they already walk in, and causing in the days ahead things to take place that they would identify as only taking place because of this increased level of favor in their life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. We receive it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's give the Lord a good shout as we start. Praise God. In the name of Jesus, receive your impartation in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Receive your impartation in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive your impartation. In the name of Jesus, receive this impartation. In the name of Jesus, every member of this family, receive this impartation. In the name of Jesus, receive this impartation. In the name of Jesus, yes, sir. Receive this impartation. In the name of Jesus, I confer it upon you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Okay. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, an impartation of superabundant, beyond measure, favor come into your life beginning right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. An impartation of the favor of God to another level, a higher level. Come into your life tonight, right now, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Impartation, come into your life right now, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Father. I confer it upon her. I confer it upon him. In the name of Jesus, an impartation of favor beyond measure, super abundant, in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Receive it in Jesus' mighty name. An impartation of superabundant, beyond measure, favor in the name of Jesus. That's what I like to see, enthusiasm about it. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. An impartation of the favor of God, superabundant, beyond measure, favor in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, impartation of, of the favor of God, superabundant and beyond measure. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Father. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, an impartation of superabundant, beyond measure favor in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Receive an impartation of the favor of God, superabundant and beyond measure in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, for an impartation of superabundant, beyond measure favor in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, receive a fresh impartation of superabundant, beyond measure favor in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, receive it. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Father. Impartation of the favor of God to a higher level in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Receive it, receive it, and receive it. In Jesus' name, an impartation of the favor of God, super abundant and beyond measure. In Jesus' name, amen. 
In the name of Jesus, receive it. Thank you very much. In Jesus' name, on these children. In Jesus' name, receive it, sir. You got it? You got it. In the name of Jesus, receive it, young people. In, receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Super abundant and beyond measure. Favor. In the name of Jesus. Yes, you got it. Get a double portion. In Jesus' name. Super abundant, beyond measure. Favor of God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Super abundant, beyond measure. Favor. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. In Jesus' name. Super abundant, beyond measure. Favor of God. In the name of Jesus. Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Receive your impartation. In the name of Jesus. Receive it. In Jesus' name. Receive super abundant and beyond measure favor in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Super abundant, beyond measure favor from the Lord Almighty in Jesus' name. Receive it. Thank you, Father, for the favor of God on these children, on these parents. In Jesus' mighty name, to a higher level, super abundant, beyond measure, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it, Father. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you for it, Father, and every member of this family, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Super abundant and beyond measure, favor, in the name of Jesus, on every member of this family. Jesus' name, every member of this family, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for super abundant, beyond measure favor. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for this impartation into their lives right now. In the name of Jesus, I believe it's going to cause their faith to grow stronger in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Super abundant, beyond measure favor. Thank you, sir. In the name of Jesus, and every member of this family, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you, Lord, for super abundant, beyond measure favor. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, receive your impartation in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. All right. In the name of Jesus, super abundant, but beyond measure, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for it, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, super abundant, beyond measure, favor. In Jesus' name, yours tonight, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you for this impartation, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get unhooked so we can hook up on something else. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a good shout of praise. We already got that section. All right, praise God. Super abundant, beyond measure, favor on every member of this family. Glory to God. Super abundant, beyond measure, in Jesus' name. Now remember, in the literal Greek, it said a grace gift accompanied with joy. Where's your joy? Where's your joy? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. All right. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, I got it. 
and give the Lord another shout. Praise God.